wonderful. Um, for those of you who don't know me, perhaps I can start just very briefly by saying something about not who I am necessarily, but really me and my capacity as the insiders, founder of Insiders Outsiders. And actually, Karen is an unusual figure. I think, Karen, you're aware of that, that actually um, the primary sort of impulse behind my initiating the Insiders Outsiders project um, was to pay tribute in a detailed and more nuanced way than usual to the tremendous mm. contribution made by refugees from <laughs> Nazi Europe to British culture across all the art forms. And that's a kind of off... Could, would you mind everybody muting yourselves, if you don't mind, since we are recording this? Thanks. Um, and then as a kind of offshoot of that, we have, and if you go to the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, you will see for yourselves that there is a kind of subsection called second and third generation. So most of the younger people that we have had talking have been directly descended from those who found sanctuary here from Nazi Europe back in the 1930s and occasionally after after the war as well. And Karen, your background, perhaps in fact we can start there, but you know, your background is not as directly connected and yet you have taken it upon yourself in a obviously very impassioned and committed way to engage with this difficult, dark, troubling and yet fascinating history. So yes, let's, let's start. Let's start there without further ado. Tell us about your own background and indeed how you came to this, what you, what yes, I say, yeah. is it's a real deep preoccupation with a troubled Jewish history connected very much to do with the Nazi past. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think um, I just sort of went through life um, knowing that I was Jewish and following certain traditions of the family, but we weren't religious. And I I didn't really have any concerns about um, anti-Semitism as such personally, although as a child there were a few issues, um, people shouting Jew across the street, <laughs> things like that. But um, and, and also I felt different because, you know, we'd start school in September, and then we had to take time off for mm. the Jewish holidays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I'm sorry to um, interrupt, but just tell us, just in a nutshell, you know, your, oh yes. you know, at what stage your family came to this country? Just oh yes, apologies. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother, came here from Poland, from a place called Pitrakov, um, Pitrakov Trybunalski, when she was, um, I think she was probably about twelve. Uh, with her family, and um, they left behind um, family members, um, cousins, uncles, grandparents, and it was later in life that I found out, oh, well, I was aware that there were um, gaps in our family tree, um, and it just said Treblinka, or murdered in the Holocaust, and that was it, really, and it was only when I started doing research uh, five years ago that I looked into it a bit more deeply and I made an artwork um, I think it's called Family Ties um, which was about uh, one one branch of the family who were were murdered in Treblinka the parents the children uh, young children and um, I contacted someone in America um, a, fam um, a distant cousin and they had the whole family tree so I learned a lot more about that side of my family and um and, and it wasn't really talked about. I mean, my grandmother never talked about it. In fact, you know, I, do, I can't even remember her having an accent. You know, there was nothing there. And her, my grandfather came from, um, it was Ukraine, but the Austrian, um, Hungarian um, area. And um, so I didn't, I really didn't know anything about them. Um, my parents didn't talk about it either. So. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit frustrating now to 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 know all this and and not be able to talk to anybody about it. But I think a lot of if I can just interrupt there in yes. that respect, you are mm. absolutely saying what all the other members, you know, that more directly, you know, sort of descendants, the second and, and indeed third and even the yes. case, fourth generation, are saying that if only we'd ask all these gaps, yes. etc. And I think actually just just making a more general observation before we carry on, it's actually very important. I think for I suspect you all know this already, but for a wider sort of public to be aware that actually even for those Jewish families who came to this country at the turn of the century as part of that big Eastern European and Russian um, um, sort of wave of immigrants fleeing Tsarist persecution, of course, their families too, those who were left behind, also mostly perished in the Holocaust. So there is that dark Holocaust background, isn't there, as well? Okay. So, yes, sorry, uh, let's go back to, to, to your, you know, how you came to be an artist, how you came to grapple with these yeah. things. Um, 
Well, I mean, I think I think the most interesting thing is to look back at your at your heritage and your genes and to find out there's a definite link for creativity in your family. So it doesn't come from nowhere, um, being able to stitch. I mean, my mother was um, an incredible seamstress. I mean, she she worked in the 1970s. She worked for uh, one of the top designers at that time, John Bates, whose, whose uh, collection was Jean Ferron. And uh, she made his collection. And I mean, I, I gave it no thought once again at the time when she came home with a Vogue magazine said, oh, I made this and I made that. But it sounds very glamorous, but before, she got to that stage. I mean, when we were children, we'd come home from school and you could still hear the noise of an industrial sewing machine of her in her bedroom in our school flat with four children. And she was making sample pieces. Well, they were, you know, she was given, she was, what would you call, what do you call them? Piece uh, making out of pieces. You know, someone would deliver all the parts that you needed for a suit or a or a coat or whatever, and she would be in there putting them together and they would be sent out to, um, to you know, um, <laughs> after the shock of everything, my, my brain isn't um, on full speed. Yeah, to, um, uh, to shops, to the large. And your grandmother yeah. was obviously also a very- Oh my goodness, my grandmother. Person. I mean, who knew? I mean, um, it was only, it was only last week that I looked again at the family tree and it says that she was a tailoress. She was married at 21, spinster tailoress. And um, and I think my grandfather was also a presser. He was, you know, he used to be a tailor's presser and um, he was 10 years older than her. So I only really looked into that quite recently. But, so I was thinking, I don't know much about her, but, but in, in her later life after my grandfather passed away um she said she was very lonely and she needed to find something to do so um incredibly she started making these wonderful collages i mean out of textiles uh beautiful beautiful um all different all different types of themes including jewish themes and um she had more than one i think um, exhibitions at the Whitechapel Library. Wow. Is it? Uh, in her 70s, um, yeah, late 70s, she was still, she was making these <laughs> wonderful pieces and um, we were very proud of her. So and, clearly uh, textiles was, are in your blood, aren't they, by the look Yes, of textiles are in our blood, yes. Yeah, so, so it's just um, quite, it's quite interesting to know that, that my both but my sisters are also very talented with the needle and knitting needle. And recently, my my younger daughter said, oh, I'm just starting to crochet. But well, how on earth have you learned how to crochet? And suddenly yeah. she's made, one of her first things she made was a blanket. And then she made a baby's blanket for, for her little oh. her niece. And suddenly, you know, from nowhere, she can crochet. I mean, I can't crochet and I can't knit, but I can sew. Wonderful. And am I right in thinking you didn't have a conventional sort of art training as such, did you? I mean, you were something of a latecomer? Very much yes, latecomer, yeah. yes. I would, I would say that. I mean, I was always making, always um, sticking and gluing and uh, I made, um, I, I uh, designed cakes, cake decoration and design, um, all different types of things and brooches. As I grew up, all different things. But um, oh. yeah, it was only later um, in life oh, I just started, I started making um, miniature dolls' house samples for adult collectors, and um, yeah, it was a, a fantastic fifteen years of making these because I was always interested in dolls' houses and uh, and, and not stitching before that. So um, and that was when uh, my first daughter was a baby, and that was fifteen years apprenticeship. To, to achieve what I do now with miniature stitching and um, so I did that I was doing that and then I I did a sitting gills and creative embroidery over two years as part-time just one night a week and somebody one of the tutors said I think you should do a degree which I thought was absolutely ridiculous mm -hmm. um, but she said no there's a really good degree and um, it will suit you and um, she said she had done it herself so I, I went and I was accepted for the course in applied arts and um, I did it part time um, because I had young children 
And um, yeah, I was a part-time full-timer because <laughs> it's just my nature to, to go one step further. And yeah, so that was incredible. I mean, it changed my life really um, for yeah. the best doing that. I think we should start showing the PowerPoint so you can yes, start I think that not everybody is. here perhaps is coming here. with your work. Shall I, should, should we do that? Or I, I think that's- Yes, yes, please. Yes. Very good. Now let's hope that technology does not betray us on this occasion. <laughs> let's just, um, there we are. How does that look? Can everybody see the screen? Can everybody see the full screen? Karen, is that okay? Yes, I would see the full Lovely. screen. Okay, right. Yes. Okay, so you wanted to start with uh, with this one. Yes, I think this was an interested, interesting piece to start with, especially with the exhibition, which is um, at Docklands at the, um, where was it showing? The Museum, oh. Museum of London Docklands. Museum uh, of London Docklands, yes. And um, and they are showing the work of, uh, of Jewish people that came to this country escaping from persecution and they achieved the most incredible things in the fashion industry here. And it's definitely worth visiting. Um, and then it, it just reminded me of this piece because originally I, I was going to make a piece about mm. the success of the people who came from Germany and, and Austria um, who were in the fashion industry. Uh, but then I thought, um, I thought about it again, but well, we know about those people, but we don't know about those who are hugely talented, amazing um, skills and innovation who were basically they they lost everything in 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 berlin this is based in berlin they they lost everything after um the Lunch. nazis came to power so um so i found a, i had a, an old atlas it was a miracle that i had this for many many years and i thought this would be a good starting point and it's open to central europe with um berlin at its core and um so i there wasn't that much information, but I, I found as much as I could for these people, just so that they were remembered, so they were a memorial to those who uh, were murdered, who were, or, or tried to escape and were caught and sent to concentration camps, or they just weren't seen ever again. And um, so I thought it's important to, to recognize them and their individuality and skills. And um, I was always interested in swatches, so these particular swatches are of great importance because I put a call out asking people to, um, if they could send me their old couples or skull caps that are worn by Jewish people in the synagogue or you know, special occasions and weddings and for mitzvahs and everything. And I got a huge, <laughs> I got a huge amount of them in all beautiful colors and everything. And uh, they became my swatches. So they're, they, they are very important to me in that in that respect and then then we have to think back to Adefa which was set up in 1933 and it was their aim to remove the whole of uh, the Jewish fashion industry from just white off the planet basically um, that was their focus and they actually achieved their goal and now you know Berlin is not thought of as the center of great fashion I mean you think of France or Paris and places like that, but they never quite gained that um, incredible um, achievement of having the top fashion industry in Berlin because the Jewish people were, 49% of the Jewish people in Berlin working in the fashion industry uh, were hugely successful and talented, but we forget that they were working side by side with non-Jewish people. You know, they created buttons and um, lace and beautiful fashions for children and adults and ready to ready to wear was a new a new thing then. So all of this was just lost. I mean it was a a loss to the Jewish community. It was a loss to the non-Jewish community and a loss to humanity basically to to people today because um, they were lost through propaganda and blacklisting and yeah sadly the goal was achieved and, and 
very, very few of these people um, survived. Mm. But if we go, we could just skip over the next one for time. Don't, don't worry. Perhaps before we go to the next um, slide, I could just sort of make a few comments here. I mean, yes. one is that it's precisely, and this is a general point, but it's the disproportionately large contribution of the Jews to German culture, whether it was fashion or anything else that aroused so much fierce, profound yeah. resentment, which is all part of you know, what anti-Semitism is, of course, about. So that's one general point. And um, just also a very practical thing for those of you who haven't seen the uh, Fashion City exhibition at the uh, Museum of London Docklands, it's actually just been extended, I think, into July. So you have a chance to, to see it if you haven't yet done so. Um, I also just wanted to make again a, a, another you know, general but quite important comment that actually Insiders Outsiders is very much about celebrating achievement, you know, extraordinary contribution to this country's culture. Um, and yet one must never forget that A, not everybody who came to this country thrived, but actually more importantly still, that in every, you know, I'm willing to bet that in every individual case of achievement and success, in a given field is a story of profound loss. The family, so many family members left behind, they never saw again, they, they perished. So that's really, really important as well. And I just then like to move on to one very specific thing and that there is a new book coming out. Um, actually, gosh, I think it's the end of this month and we are doing an event. I think it's the 29th, you'll have to check. Yes, 29th of um, April to, to mark its appearance about an Otti Berger who actually ties in very well with this. She was actually of Yugoslav Jewish origin, worked at the Bauhaus as a textile designer, uh, had to flee, came to this country, didn't thrive and she went back and she was murdered in Auschwitz. And I think this is, you know, okay. again, it all part of this bigger story, isn't it? So I would urge you if you're interested in, in textiles and uh, uh, she's a fascinating, wonderful figure. So, so do, do check that out. All right, so enough from me. Let's let's continue to the next. Uh, uh, did you say you wanted, do you want to skip over? Oh this? yes, well, perhaps just a very short brief, brief. Um, comment on um, Kirsten and Tutor. Because, um, as you can see, um, it just says famous for women's clothing and exclusive fashion shows, Erinized in 1937, um, which meant that all of their, their, their business was uh, handed over to non-Jewish um, people. Anyway, uh, and all I had was in 1939, Tutor took his own life. Now, now, it turns out Jacob Tutor was a highly successful, innovative um, fashion businessman and um, I was contacted by um, a relative of his um, and she told me that her mother was directly related to him and came from Germany and um, and I got to hear much more about his life and um, in Berlin he, he had he had this incredible building designed um, for a fashion a fashion shop more than a shop, a departmental store for fashion uh, with incredible things going on and a huge triple windows created. Uh, you would not have seen that until, you know, much later. Um, and you can, you know, you take it for granted now, you see these big fashion windows in Harrods and uh, Selfridges, but um, it was a, a new thing in, in Berlin. It was hugely dynamic. And um, so he, he was, so successful he had two villas he was married to a model um uh, who came from a poor background and she wasn't jewish and as time went on things got more and more difficult for him as you can see um they took away his business and and he had these two villas they were taken from him and he was put into a boarding house with his wife and to cut a long story short his wife um wasn't very happy and she just told them to take away the Jew boy, she said. So he had basically lost everything. And um, he, he took it, as it says, he took his own knife. He, he first killed his beloved dog, and then he used veronal and uh, poisoned himself. I mean, from being such a successful entrepreneur to be down to this stage in his life and um, just pushed away as a basically a, a dirty Jew by his wife um, is appalling. And so there are so many stories out there of people's families and um, the devastation caused by hate, bigotry. Um, so that, that was quite um, interesting to find out more 
about Karen, can I just ask you something um am I right in thinking that in this particular piece you don't actually mention the business of killing his dog first and the taking of the... no and no. this is something maybe we'll come back to because you you yeah. take of it you, you know the, the the words you so beautifully so in your work in in your mixed media works they're very um what shall I say they're stripped it's sort of the facts are stripped down to their bare bones aren't they it's almost detached and I think that's a, quite a deliberate decision on your yes uh, yes yes it is I just I just found it was important to just say this is what happened mm. like in the case above um arrested by the Nazis deported to uh, Westerville um concentration camp or or you know escaped from Berlin but was picked up in in the Netherlands or wherever and uh, killed. Yes, I think we need to it's sort of like following um, the same route as the Nazis. We did this, we're gonna, we killed without any feeling, but I, I want people to just see what happened without any flannel. This is, this is what happened to these people, liquidated, build, uh, uh, liquidated businesses and uh, you know, murders forced out volu voluntarily um, handing over their their properties and their businesses. Yes, it, there there is a sort of a reason for it. I think people can you you have your own emotions, your own feelings. You can read into it what you like. I mean, the, what is there is there is a story behind what I I've stitched. And you know, possibly all the more powerful, precisely because it's so under, in a sense, understated. It's yeah, yeah. Shall we? Shall we continue? Yes. 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 This is um uh, my most recent finished work, and it's it says wound or wound. It it's actually both. It's a wound and it's wound. And the interesting um concept about this uh, concerning this is the fact that all of those threads, those balls of threads were used by my mother at that time that I discussed where she sat at the sewing machine, at the industrial sewing machine in her bedroom. And those, those were the threads that she used at that time, you know, the cotton with the, the uh, cardboard in the center. And I just didn't know what I would do with them. I didn't really give them much thought, but eventually this year they ended up here. And what I did is I used I, I selected the names of seamstresses or tailoresses um, who were murdered in the, in the Holocaust. And, the, and I brought them together because they all came from or had a connection to Pietrakov, Trubonowski, where my grandmother came from. So I, and all of these people, um, including um, here, this is actually my mother's cousin here. Um, I have this sort of thought now that perhaps I should have added my mother and my um, grandmother as well um, as still standing and perhaps the cousin will be um, lying flat like the others. Um, they're all wound um, with, with a thread and also a tiny um, stone. That stone and um, being wound to this wound on to here is like tied. They were tied to their homeland. They couldn't escape. Things were very bad for them. And, um, but it's also on top of that, the stone is of vital importance to this piece because these are memorials. They're memorials to these women, who, innocent people who were just living their lives. And um, a stone, it, it's, um, it's a tradition in the Jewish religion that if you visit a um, a cemetery and the grave of your family, mm. you, you place the stone onto the grave and just to say, we remember you. And this is my way of remembering these people. And just to say also that the wound, the wound is a gaping wound to so many families where, where a section was cut out or whole members of a family leaving just one to bear witness, um, it, it leaves the gaping wound in Jewish families. So yeah, that was quite important to me. And it, it felt very personal because I was using um, my late mother's threads. Yeah, there's some details on the next slide, I think. 
yeah, there's some details of it. So you can see um, all these tiny hand-stitched memorials to tailoresses and seamstresses. And, and, and there are details about them. It gives you a little history of where they, where they were murdered, many in Treblinka and um, concentration camp, murder camp, and also um, the date that they were killed and uh, whether they were married or single or a sister, a sister or a cousin. So yeah, that's, that's just a close up of the work, which I love because it, it looks like a huge celebration, doesn't it, of color, um, but it's no celebration at all. How are you set about finding out even the bare bones of these lives? Tell us a little bit about your, you know, your research process. Yeah, the research, yes. I, I use the um, um, Yad Vashem website for, for many of them, not all because um, I have had people contact me and um, privately and we've discussed their families and I have made individual, very personal, um, artworks for them but I do use that but it, it might sound simple but it's it takes um, weeks to trawl through because not everyone was a tailoress or you know people there were doctors and artists and you know just uh, the butchers which is uh, you know just so many different people teachers um, so yeah, it takes it takes a long time to to research the individuals, um, especially when you got a theme based, especially here where it was just doing Pietrakov, Trubonowski, which was very important. So yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a, a grueling um, process, but it, it's a worthwhile process as a memorial. Indeed. Yes, this is a very interesting piece uh, called Selection. And um, when I first started creating this work, I was remembering and um, memorializing those who were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and, but I had to reduce the amount of people because obviously, you know, uh, over 6 million Jewish people were murdered during the Holocaust. And I decided to um, select um, those who wore spectacles, which was also a major trawling process to find to find all the people who wore spectacles and you know sort of echoing in the back of my mind for the images of um, Auschwitz and the huge piles of glasses spectacles that were which were discarded from Jewish people and I can't imagine how it must feel to not even have your spectacles so you could see properly I mean you know I, I find that a major problem as just in my ordinary life. Um, anyway, so I, I was selecting these people and it was a selection process, but in a different way for, for those who were selected by the Nazis to the left or the right. I wanted to select them, to remember them and to give them some dignity. And um, but I felt I needed to go one step further with this piece. So I actually um, researched Jewish people who have been murdered in more recent years, and um, that was another traumatic experience. And I, I wanted to say that anti-Semitism didn't begin with the Holocaust, and it definitely didn't end with the Holocaust, as we are finding today, here we are today in the 21st century, with this um, extreme rise in anti-Semitism. So it's sort of scary for me um, that I started this five years ago and now I'm continuing this process of, of collecting people who have been murdered um, very very recently and so this is a continuum it's a I'm continuing to with this artwork yeah, I've done selection one and then we can go to the next page um, this is selection two when I was in Riga last year and it's actually made up of one and a half, um, one and a half of these uh, display cases. And uh, it was interesting to see that one, one you cannot see, it was only half filled. And the curator, I spoke to him about that, and he said he thought it was rather important to have that space that you know could either be filled or is also a reminder that people 
haven't been remembered, but people, you know, were murdered and forgotten. So that was quite interesting. This was a very interesting piece because it was absolutely like none of the other pieces in that exhibition. So, um, and then we can go on to the third slide. Karen, before we continue, oh, sorry. You, no, no, you very interestingly, you showed me, you actually held up for me oh, to yes. see the, the, the discs and also the stones, just to get a sense of scale, because of course on the screen, it's yes, hard to this is, yeah. This is the size, you can see it's tiny. Mm -hmm. So it's only, I, I mean, it's only about three centimeters across. I mean, to, to fit in so much, I could bring it up closer. You can see the text, which is hand stitched onto onto this um, piece um, and there's many and um, and I'm adding to it day by day basically now as we will see yes um, so this this is particularly heartbreaking now because um, up to this stage I've managed to put up a barrier there's a barrier between me and the work because otherwise I wouldn't be able to make it because it's such an emotional um, piece of work. And here we arrive at um, the 7th of October, 2023. And suddenly I'm hand stitching selection three in real time. And there was no barrier. I mean, I was having nightmares. I, I couldn't sleep properly and um, that these innocent people um, have been murdered in their homes or, or young people in a festival. And, um, and you know, here they are. There they are with their spectacles. I mean, this lady here, Gina, she was a Holocaust survivor. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. This is, this is what my work is all about, basically. Here is Clara, 65, married with two children, and she's murdered in Sobibor, Poland, extermination, extermination camp in 1943. She was just an innocent woman getting on with her life, and she was murdered because she was Jewish. Then we step forward to 2018, and here's Mireille. I think you might pronounce it that. My French isn't brilliant. She was an 85-year-old Holocaust survivor who was stabbed 11 times and set on fire in Paris, murdered. And, and she is one of the very, very few people um, that I selected who didn't wear glasses because I felt we have to remember her and remember what is going on today. And, and then here we are. I mean, this is crazy. This is September 7th of October 2023 in Israel. And Gina Semiati, I, can't, I think that's how you pronounce it, she's 90 years old. She too is a Holocaust survivor, dragged into her living room from her safe room and shot through the head. I mean, is this the way that this lady, who looks so dignified, is this the way for her to end her life after all the suffering that she? she experienced during the Holocaust. This is what my work is trying to convey, that we have to be aware of what hate can do in the 1940s and before that, and in the 21st century, and last year, this year. This is, this is what I'm, I'm trying to convey in my work. Yeah, this is the weight of the world, 2022. And I was very much aware of this um, rise in anti-Semitism and I created this. This is, this is a, we call it a talus, but it's a prayer shawl. And it's such a wonderful traditional garment that you would just, a man, I mean, today women also in a liberal um, synagogue or would wear um, a French shawl. But this to me is like the essence of my father. And we weren't really religious father, but we used to go, my father in particular, used to go to um, the synagogue on, on occasions, on special occasions, you know, for the important, um, the important uh, festivals. And so to me, 
it was sort of the most gentle reminder of my dad, but I turned it on its head because now I've made it from scrap, but I've used um, the fringes, the fringes that you can see here and everything, and this part that goes around the neck um, from an old talus or prayer shawl. And I've made this myself and I've hands, instead of usually you see the lines, there's a lines either black or blue on a, on a, on a prayer shawl and um, a comforting, something that just takes me back millennia, really, something in my soul. But this has been, it, it is no longer a usable item because it's hand-stitched with, from 2021, all of the anti-Semitic incidents globally, um, 2021, and I could have just gone on and on and on with this. And they're tiny, really tiny, tiny stitches, which we may see on the next slide, I think. Uh, which is appalling, really, you know. Even then, we've got Jewish scumbag and something Jewish dog and um, an anti-Semitic uh, graffiti and free Palestine and Israel equals Nazis daubed on synagogues or, or in a child's playground, you know, um, so many really, yes, the Jews, the vermin, bringing about a second Holocaust. I mean, it was difficult to stitch that, I have to say. It was it was selected for um, a fine art textiles gallery uh, exhibition and it was on display. And I was, I was really delighted about how it was displayed. And it, it caused a lot of, um, a lot of dialogue from that and a lot of interest. And um, and the interesting thing was that uh, <laughs> is that that it was in a it's in an environment which is not a Jewish environment. This is the knitting and sticking show is open to everybody. And that's what I wanted to say about all of my work, except for the first piece I made. None of them have been shown in um, um, a Jewish environment or or um, a Jewish sort of um, a, a, a synagogue or or any any place. These are out there in the real world. Every single piece has been out there, and this is what I want because, as a Jewish person, I think we know we already know this. We already know what's going on. So I'm very grateful for when when the work has been selected for exhibitions because it's important for it to be out there. Really, um, yeah. So that. That's a, that's a really sensitive piece for me as well. Karen, would you also, in an ideal world, like some of these pieces to be shown in a specifically Jewish context as well? I mean, I take your point absolutely about wanting to get out and reaching as wide an audience as possible. Does part of you perhaps also wish it to be seen in a more specifically Jewish environment? Yes, I mean, I mean, really, any anywhere, really. I think I think there's there's no reason for us all to be reminded of, of what's going on or what happened. And in fact, I just, um, it's not the best reading matter to take away with you, but I took a, a, a memoir of Roman Halter, mm. um, who was the only member of his family to survive the Holocaust. And it was about his childhood and incredible um, piece of writing. And at the beginning, I think it's, um, um, uh, Martin Gilbert, so Martin Gilbert, he wrote in it that every year we should read something, you know, what he has written, what Roman Hall wrote, what anybody has written, that we need to be reminded ourselves, including me, reminded so that we continue to remember because we are at a stage now where uh, sadly, you know, uh, Holocaust survivors are are dying out. Those incredible people that went into schools and discussed what they went through, um, they're not they're not around. They're not going to be around. I mean, I I made a piece about uh, Leslie Kleinman, MBEM, and um, he's no longer with us. I wanted to go back. I I wanted to show him the work that I made, and then we went into lockdown, and sadly he deteriorated and he passed away and. And I thought this is a, a real sadness that he never got to see this work I made about him, about his family, about his experience, that he was the only one from his immediate family who survived. 
I think his sister may have survived, but she died in the concentration camp from um, some horrible disease. So I'm thinking, yes, you're right, you're right, Monica. But we, yes, perhaps in a Jewish environment too is important so that we continue to remember because I have to continue to rem remember and I'm doing the research, you know, every day of the week, but I need to be reminded. I mean, it sounds like a similar story, but when you when you multiply that by six million, you know, people. Of course, um, there's more to it than that, though. I suppose what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, we all think we know probably more than we want to know about the Holocaust, but actually the way you deal with the subject and the kind of finely crafted nature and the sensitivity and the, as I said earlier, the understatement of the way you present the material. I mean, you're doing something very special, I think. Um, and if I could Thank just you. actually jump on the name Roman, I actually had the honour and, and pleasure of knowing Roman slightly. He was a wonderful man. But I'd like to also mention that he has an artist son called Ardin Walter. I don't know if you've come across him at all. He's also an artist who divides his time between Israel and London. And he has written a really, again, a very beautifully written Book. I don't know quite what you call it. It's not really a memoir, but it's very much a second generation uh, grappling with with being the son of a Holocaust survivor. And it's called The Fire and the Bonfire. And I heartily recommend it for those of you who haven't yet. Yes, I think books. that would be one that I add to my book list. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Indeed. Shall, shall we? Um... Yes. Did you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. There we go. Yes. So I continue with the theme of anti-Semitism. It's obviously very close to my heart and my sensitivity that we continue. This was a continuation. This was 2022 when I started making typecast. And this is not finished because so many things have come and happened and in the way that I haven't been able to continue it. But I, I strangely knew when I did it, when I started stitching 2022, that, um, sorry, my cat has suddenly jumped on my lap. Um, in 2022 that this would be an ongoing artwork but it wouldn't I knew it wouldn't end in 2022 I would continue stitching it in 2023 and it appears I will be stitching it in 2024 but I haven't been able to um return to it it's it's waiting but you can see some of the, the text and it's it's actually I tried to do the text as if it was on a typewriter and I've had this typewriter for quite a long period of time and um, it's from Germany. And um, we could go to the next slide to have a detail, please. And this is very interesting because this, I, I, I was stitching this before uh, the 7th of October, 2023. And this is what I stitched. I removed the typewriter ribbon that was there, uh, which was a strange, was sort of quite discomforting that that um, ribbon because I was thinking about what what could have been actually typed on there in the 1930s um, anyway so this ribbon now says hatred of the Jews is being whipped up again the Jews are murdering Spain it could be any country here the Jews are criminal people all crimes can be tra traced back to the Jew and the people are so stupid and they believe everything now this came from Victor Klemper's diaries from 1937. And I read those, I read all of his diaries. And there's something really important, I think, to read something from that period, at that period. But sometimes people's um, memories aren't as clear. And most of the, the books I try to read are from that period because they're so immediate and this is exactly what's happening. So you can't actually say, oh, well, you know, well, did it really happen? This really did happen. And um, I've made other artworks using the diaries of Victor Klemper and um, his life and incredible, incredible diaries and definitely, definitely worth reading. So uh, this was here and um, I'm not, I don't think there is another... Uh, no. no, there's not another slide of that one. But anyway, we can go on to next year in Jerusalem. And I've been collecting these little glasses for quite a period of time. Um, there's some really cute ones there, really pretty little glasses. And um, you know, in the Jewish religion, you know, for all occasions, um, they're called Kiddish glasses. And you just have pour some 
kiddish wine, red wine, into a glass, and they're used for all different um, festivals. And in this particular one, it's for Passover, um, which is which is we it is actually coming up soon, and it's it's. It's actually a festival about the um, Israelites um, sort of being escaping from slavery, um, biblical times, and by Moses sort of marches them out through from Egypt, and um, and so I at the end of these the service, so it's just a family service, and you know wine is usually spilt on the tablecloth and on the the um, Haggadah, which is a little prayer book of the story and that we, we go through during the service. And so, you know, wine is spilled. And in this, on this occasion, and at the end of the service, um, we say next year in Jerusalem. I mean, this goes back millennia. It's, it's just something that, it's just part of, of this ritual. And um, I thought it would be very interesting to look at those people who have been murdered in Jerusalem in recent years. And um, these are some of those people. And also um, you can see here that, that we talk about the uh, 10 plagues um, which were uh, carried out by God um, against the Egyptians. And um, so here, these ones, there's 10 of these as uh, like the 10 plagues, but um, these are, I've dripped on red Kiddush wine. The wine actually came from Israel. It was produced in Israel. And that's what I've dripped on these. But I'm just saying they symbolize, they symbolize the, the blood that has been spilt in recent years um, against people, um, innocent people. By terrorists um, in in Jerusalem, basically car rammings and shootings, and um, you know, if we go to the next one, I thought this too was a finished piece. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Don't want to sound bossy, <laughs> but um, this is all part of the service here. It's uh, called a seder plate, and these are sim symbolic of the time of the um, Israelites um, on their their escape from Egypt. Uh, but here we move on. I, I had finished this piece. I wasn't planning to add to it, but I had to go. I had I'd used up all my glasses, but I managed to find some more. And these are three innocent people, a rabbinical judge, a school principal, and a young girl, 24, who was a teacher and pregnant, who were shot dead by Hamas as a, terror, uh, a terrorist as they were waiting for a bus, a bus in Jerusalem on the 30th of November, 2023. So this is after October the 7th. And um, I don't know how much publicity it got, but um, these people, you know, their families do not welcome them home every night. These people that were innocently going onto their their works. And I know I bought a few more glasses because I feel like this is not the end, and there will be more attacks, terrorist attacks on innocent people um, in the coming months, years, who knows. Okay, so this is this is the final piece that I would like to discuss. And the other works that I've made have been difficult, they've been painful. I haven't had the barrier to protect me. And in this case, there is no barrier. And as I think I have cried over this, and I'm sure many people have cried over this piece, because I have I have selected all of the females who were murdered on the 7th of October, 2023, and raped, and the most terrible things that happened to these young people, elderly people, babies, pregnant mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, who were murdered by Hamas terrorists when they when they entered their homes or the festival in their in a place which was like you know when I'm stitching this and I think I'm in my home I 
I feel somewhat protected. I feel this is our safe place. And these these people were in their safe place. It was early in the morning. I mean, some would be in bed, they would be in their pajamas, or they were just about to make coffee. And then Hamas terrorists broke into their, their homes and murdered them viciously, wickedly. And so that is one side of this artwork. On the reverse, I have hand stitched hashtags of, of words or um, sentences, um, small sentences of what happened on that day. And, and very difficult to hand stitch. Some of the last words that some of these young, young women said on their mobile phone to their parents or, you know, or on mother who was in the situation who was contacting her children. Um, very, very painful to, to stitch. And I have to say, you can see with the names, uh, in the other pieces, you'll see their age. You will say, you would know their profession. You would know what they did. They would know if they were married or not married. But sadly, and very, very disturbingly, nobody would wants, wants to admit um, that this happened. You know, there is a real denial that innocent women suffered extreme, extremely um, devastating attacks. So um, I thought, well, if you're not interested in those people, well, you're, if you want to find out, you have to, you have to type it in on Google because I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give you any details because do you deserve them? Do, I mean, they, they <laughs> you know, to, for 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 a woman in any situation to be to be um, to not be believed that they had these this trauma is devastating enough. But when when um, women's groups stay quiet, when the UN stays quiet, when the BBC stays quiet, when <laughs> generally people don't want to believe the Jewish Israeli woman when they will believe other people. And it's supposed to be me too generation. But I've stitched on here somewhere, me too, unless you're a Jew. So that's, that's really political, I know. And on the other side, if we go back to the red again. I read about what happened and in graphic detail. And for me to read it, it was so awful and so traumatic what I read that there was no way I could stitch that in my work. I just couldn't, and I I couldn't even stitch it for the sake of prosperity. Uh, is that word? I couldn't stitch it for anyone. I couldn't stitch it for history. I just had to do hashtags because that's the world we live in. We live in the world of hashtags. And um, so we have complicity, we have the oldest hatred, we have the deadliest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. It goes on about being raped and um, about abduction, about ho um, hostages, being, about being bodies being spat upon. Um, they're all there. I'm doing the same number of hashtags that there were um, women who were abused and raped and murdered and so many more. Things. So that's my work in progress, and and it's going to also feature the stone, a memorial stone, and but being about them being held down by this awful, awful um, um, episode. Episode is the wrong word, I know. But, um, yeah, so that's what I'm working on right now. Is that the last slide, Karen, or do we have an Yes, it is the last slide. It is, isn't it? Thank you so much. Do you want to just tell us, I'm just trying to envisage this work. You say it's in progress, but these will be these will be hanging sheets of fabric. Just say yes. a little more about what form it's going to take. Yes, it, it's um, it's five metres in length, about one, one and a half metres in width. It's double-sided, so it will be folded, and it will just hang up. It will have these 
I'm holding it, weighing it down will be the stones. These stones are actually, um, they actually um, found them in Israel. They will be hanging down as a memorial, but also weighing down by the history of anti-Semitism, really. And um, they are actually in the form of um, the outer shroud that would be used to wrap a body. And incredibly, um, you know, it's not incredible, but uh, but when when um, when a, a person dies, they are treated with the most. Their bodies are treated with the most incredible respect in every shape or form, and and they are dressed and washed and dressed and purified and treated with such respect, as I said. And this is the final stage of wrapping the body in the outer shroud. And that's the form. It's very simple. I mean, it's just like a sheet, isn't it? So it's, um, that's basically the form of it. It's very simple, but um, I just call it hang out to dry, hang out to dry. It is going to be hanging. And um, I feel like it says it all basically the um, title of this piece and all of my titles are of great importance. I was going to say you obviously give it very careful thought the titles work on many different levels quite often don't they and that's important I think yeah wonderful gosh uh, let's, let's stop sharing and uh, see how we're doing you were great completely unfazed by the, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> problems <laughs> early on so my, my very profound thanks to you. Um, I'm looking at the time, it is 20 to 8, but I'm thinking just because I'm going to sort of put us on gallery view so we can actually everybody can see everybody else. I assume you can if I remove just remove the spotlight so we're all kind of equal as it were. Um, although actually, you know what, I should probably keep, no, all right. Um, I think, you know, obviously if you have to leave, you have to leave, but for those of you, just because we're a small group, I think it might be very nice just to have some dialogue and comments, questions for Karen, if, if you would like. And I think just maybe just put up your hand and, um, you know, you can unmute yourself and, uh, uh, okay, uh, Linda, should we start, Linda Izan? Yeah, Linda Izan. Izan, sorry. Um, Karen, very moving indeed. Um, and I just dot, jotted down a few things and I was reflecting on your work, which is, whilst it's powerful, on, unquestionably, it has a particular feel to the work that is so different from the anger we are overwhelmed by mm -hmm. since the 7th of October. It exposes the obnoxious nature of division and hatred, which sadly does not go away. But your work is not shouty. And what we're, what we're seeing mm -hmm. is a lot of people shouting. And we think that that is the dialogue the shouting is the dialogue, but you you don't do that, and it's almost contemplative, and the viewer has to seek out the detail, and it's a quiet seeking out, and in the seeking out, it's a reflection of the terrible, the terrible actions that can be done from one human being to another. Now, it is definitely focused on the Jewish people, but we're looking at it from a Western point of view. And I am Jewish and I have a lot of, you know, skin in this game, really. But I'm also reflecting on how minorities are also treated in this way. And your words about the shroud and how the body is um, sanctified and it's not good enough for people just to be killed. People have got to be mutilated as well. And we see this across the globe. So I think that maybe you don't think about this, Karen, but I think that your work also speaks for other minorities as well. And continue it on. It's painful. You've got to be very Thank brave. You. Okay. Thank you so much, Linda. Oh, I'm, as usual, hugely eloquent and um, appear you appear to know my work better than I in your in your words I mean yes I, I have to agree with you there and um, yes I don't think 
shouting helps. I think we need to have a reasoned dialogue and, um, you know, shouting, you know, well, we know with textiles, we know that there's a very gentle way of expressing um, expressing uh, social and political um, issues in the 21st, 20, 21st century. We need to um, um, choose choose our words and we can use the tactility of cloth because as we all know and everybody has said over for a long time that um, you know it's part of who we are as human beings when we're born when we're wrapped up in we're swaddled in a cloth or you know today I walk in here on a carpet I draw the curtains I climb into bed everything we have from the minute we're born to the minute we die is cloth we can all relate to it in one way or another there's a real familiarity of that so I think that really is a very gentle way for, for expressing especially really difficult um, themes and um, and they are difficult themes and there's also that contem you know, I can't, can't say it at this stage but you're um, the fact that I sit and I'm stitching very slowly um, generally from morning to night if I have my way um, stitching just slowly stitching and thinking and trying not to think um, you know you're you're just it's, it's it's hard to explain but anyone who 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 stitches in that way who takes the time you're you're dealing with issue based work but you're also um It's also a multi-layered way of working. You know, you're stitching the word, but there's more than the word. There's more than the text, and then that's that's why I bring in other um, other objects into the piece, into any piece. There's always a reason for it. Everything that I do is thought out. Um, I mean, I could be thinking about something in the middle of the night, and it becomes a new artwork because I've thought of an object which will actually that people can relate to, that I can relate to, that actually um, just works for the, the artwork, whether it's whether it's the little glasses or it's um, or it's, it's a, a lens, um, everything has its place in my artworks. There's nothing that's put in into any piece that um, that hasn't got a meaning. There has to be a meaning for every single every single object, every single word, every stitch. And those, those stitches are not shouting at you. They're gently, they're just there to gently remind us as a people of what we are doing to each other, of hate and discrimination and racism and anti-Semitism. Um, we have to support each other and we aren't. Here, yeah, here, yeah, alas. Karen, can I pick up on something that um, you mentioned when we first talked in a preliminary sort of way already a little while ago, but that you also touched on today, the fact that you have a tendency to accumulate objects like, for example, the Kiddush cups, because you like the form of them, you, you know, obviously like the act of collecting these quite intimate small objects, and then you find a use for them in your work. But that often comes much later, doesn't it? Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, sometimes, sometimes it will happen there and then, and it. I know. I. I mean, I see. I just have this idea, and then I. I. I will find the object that I need. But like in in the form of of, um, of my little lenses, mm -hmm. which I hope one day will become a. A very large installation I will put together selection one selection two and selection three so it becomes just selection but um, yes I, I bought these um, a good few years ago for a different project entirely about eating disorders which had its own um, sensitivity and um, need to to think about the individual and you know you have to respect um, that's the main thing in my work is respect and authenticity and but in this case I, I I didn't use them for the eating disorders even though I thought it would be great because I thought there would be um you know a distortion from the from the lens but it, it just didn't work out so they were they were in my workroom on top of um 
my bookshelf for a long time and you know they came into their own in this piece which is continuing and unfortunately continuing and will become a large installation hopefully exhibited somewhere um, in the future. Am I right in suspecting that you don't sketch or make any preliminary studies for your projects that they kind of evolve organically in terms of actually handling the objects? Absolutely. Yes, they, they are organic. I mean, I I I'm I do use sketchbooks. I mean, somewhere back here you can see just a few of them. I mean, I have a huge number of sketchbooks, but they're mainly research. And um, if I make an artwork, um, I made a piece, um, the taste of things to come, and um, I just actually just um, just uh, it was in in a Martin Gilbert. Um, the Holocaust book, and it was just a sentence. And that was in my sketchbook for a long time. And I just scribbled a little pen drawing. And I knew I would eventually come back to that. And it was probably about three years later. But it was there. It was in my brain. And I have no, no need to, to make pretty pictures and sketchbook or anything. It's just, they're there. They're important. I need to go back to them. I have piles of paper, which should be in the sketchbook. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't use them as a, I, I, I have it in my brain, I have it, I have it in on bits of paper all over the place. Um, yeah, I should really go back to tidying up my sketchbooks, but not many drawings. <laughs> I mustn't hog the conversation. Would anybody else like to say something? I think Lorna has ask, her hand up. Ask something. Yes, Diana, Diana yeah. I, I just want to say um, your master craftsmanship is something quite incredible and the way you uniquely personally document history, um, I, I think it's just the most incredible life of presentation that you've built up, um, totally in admiration. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Really appreciate that coming from you. Really, thank you. Yeah. No, I mean every bit. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd like to hear what Lorna... Lorna, is that a hand? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've got my little hand up there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and just thank you for your work. It's very, very important work. And I think in a decade's time it will be even more important that these things are not hidden and they are documented. Um, what I wanted to ask was, have you found that you've lost opportunities or have you lost followers? How has what happened on the 7th of October impacted you as an artist? Because I think you've always been doing the subject matter, but I think some people engaged with it in such a way, but now the reality of what that work actually means is very different in the present climate. Thank you very much. A really important question, Lorna, and thank you for that because, um, yes, I I mean, I said to my, I say to my daughters, uh, you know, after 7th of October, I said, you know, I've lost 20 followers today. Oh, I've lost 40 followers today. I mean, I mean, this is this was actually happening. I think I must have, you know, I was sort of like on an upward, upward trajectory with my followers, and I was really, you know, I don't follow them, you know, I don't look every day, but I did become quite obsessed because I think I must have lost at the very least 250 followers which in a very short period of time and um that was that was sort of shocking when i mentioned it to one of my daughters she says but i don't understand mum because as you say lorna i've been making this work for five years so i i wasn't actually doing anything different i mean i know i'm i'm documenting in real time now but um I'm so grateful to those people that have stood by me and support what I do. And I'm really grateful for their comments. I've had private comments, including from yourself, uh, which have made all the difference to me because you can actually um, feel very alone, very alone indeed. I'm just grateful to some of the people who are here who have been um, a major support and friendship base for me where we can discuss things and and I love them for it because as I said it's very lonely when you feel like everyone hates you 
I know everyone doesn't hate me, but you know, it's uh, it's difficult because you think, well, what's going on? Why, why are they suddenly leaving in droves? I mean, what does this mean? And um, well, there was one situation which I can't go into into great detail, but someone shared my work, um, shared my work, and um, and a very well known textile artist wrote something extremely racist and upsetting and and I asked for it to be removed and it wasn't removed and I feel like I wasn't supported and it was racist and I was very disturbed by it I mean right up to today I'm still disturbed that I wasn't supported by these people who I've been part of their group for a good number of years and I think you you have to think about freedom of speech and I absolutely applaud freedom of speech but when freedom of speech freedom of speech is abused then we have to be very very concerned because yeah that's it really when freedom of speech is abused and people think they can just say what they like as cause of freedom of speech and not be pulled up when it's racist or it's anti-Semitic, it's a mm -hmm. huge concern for Jewish people, and it, as it would be for any other minority. And like it or not, Jewish people are a real minority. They are less than 0.2% of us in the world. We are a tiny minority, and we are not. <laughs> I don't want to get onto my high horse about it, so I'll stop there. But um, yeah, it, Lorna, it's it's been horrible. And I've had people contacting me privately who say they've lost friends and, and it's been difficult for them. You know, the silence and lack of support from other people has been very, very difficult for many, many Jewish people mm -hmm. because something happened in Israel, which was the most, diabolical, awful um, situation, the worst situation for Jewish people since the Holocaust. And there's a silence and there's support of a Hamas terrorist genocidal um, organization and not a support for the Jewish people. We have to support both sides. We have to support the Palestinians and, and we have to support the Israelis. There is none of that. There's only a one-sided dialogue and it's definitely not for the Israelis and it's definitely not for the Jewish people. So like I said to you, Karen, when I said that I wouldn't share your post on Instagram and I didn't mean, I didn't want to be offensive, but the reality is I knew you would get a backlash. So I thought to protect you, I wouldn't I share your work because that's the reality of where we're at. And I think a lot of people have never met any Jewish people. They just hear the story, but they haven't actually even met Jewish people. But when you were talking about sewing, I remember my mum working in factories in New Cross. So she would always be working with, many times they'd be the bosses. You know, I remember Harold and he was the Jewish guy. And yes. so always having that um, relationship with people and knowing Jewish people. So not that that should make a difference. No, but it does make a difference. There's a connection, you see. Yeah, but it's, yeah, so it's just, I think as an artist, it's such a difficult time because as an artist, an artist should have freedom of speech, but you don't. And I just hope that it doesn't impact your career too much. But I know when I sit on selection panels, things like this and different groups, they are discussed and they are decisions that are made. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Lorna, I really Thank you. That's really it. valuable sort of uh, discussion. It'd be interesting to see, you know, in five years' time when the immediate horror has subsided, you know, where things might recalibrate them. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Can I add just one? Yeah, yes. Yeah, sorry, is that Susan? Yeah. No, it's Mirka. Uh, so, um, Mirka, sorry, I'm looking for. Uh, yes. So, um, uh, I got in touch with Karen after. Yeah, I do you want to put your, sorry, do you want to put your camera on so we can see you? No, no. I, I can't. You don't, right. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, when I came across Karen's work, I was so taken aback 
And I incorrectly assumed anyone who would do work like that must be a child of Holocaust survivors mm. like myself. And so I got in touch with her. And when I learned that, in fact, she didn't have that connection, the immediate connection the way I do, I was blown away by her dedication, mm. her patience, her perseverance. And she became a huge source of inspiration for me because I've been gathering information for years to do a textile, a fiber art project on my own family. And seeing what she has been able to accomplish, given a different, slightly different background, has really uh, been a huge source of support for me. And um, I have been moving forward as a result of getting to know her. So I'm supremely mm -hmm. grateful. Mm -hmm. I think Mir, I you. have missed my comments at the very beginning. I made exactly that point that actually the Insiders Outsiders project tends to focus uh, on those of direct descent. That's right, the sort of second, third generations. And Karen's, you're, I suppose you're an honorary member of that generation, aren't you, in a sense, who've taken this to your heart and, you know, engage with it so very profoundly. Uh, but yes, unusual. But also, and as we also said, that even those Jews who came to America or England um, at the, around the turn of the century, you know, they left those behind who did indeed suffer and often perish in the Holocaust. So there are actually much tighter connections than one sometimes, you know. And I just want to make one point of uh, clarification. I do not live in Los Angeles. I oh, live... sorry. <laughs> it's OK. Um, but I live two and a half hours north of San Francisco. Yeah, well, duly noted, duly noted. Susan, did you have your hand up? I don't know if you wanted to add something. Un unmute yourself. Hi, um, just a couple of comments, really. I think as an artist, uh, Karen shouldn't have to be grateful for support that she receives from everybody. She's been doing this work for a long time on all different subjects. So does that mean that if you are, um, you know, compiling work on a different subject, you've also got criticism in, in such a, a strong way? Um, I mean, the work is absolutely incredible. And although... I have been familiar with it over, you know, the period of time that she's been doing it. I think it's even more powerful and even more shocking. And in terms of uh, the selection process that you're doing, Karen, I mean, unfortunately, this work should be a, a small piece of work, not growing by the minute by the week by the month so um it is just absolutely incredible and um you know uh, and i know how much work and research goes into absolutely every single stitch so really it's fantastic amazing thank you thank you, thank you very much for that um susan that's actually a quite an interesting point because i i never lost followers <laughs> making any of my other works it's true no none at all i might have gained followers but um not lost followers so that's that's a very interesting point and thank you for your kind words about my work um appreciated karen i'm looking at the clock it's two yes. past eight um but i think I, I i think i have a plan and once again apologies for all the sort of mess up at the beginning i'm really embarrassed and you know really sorry about that but i think what we should do is actually circulate the recording of this actually rather wonderful event i think everybody would agree tonight to all those who were left out of it and then actually have allow them to watch maybe those of you who are here today might like to re-watch it if you're if you like but then actually to sort of find another date um, in the not too distant future where we might reconvene all of us um and people yeah and you know people can have watched your exposition you're, you're talking about the work and then come prepared to ask questions and to actually pursue a conversation but to have a more perhaps informal discussion about your work and its implication does that sound a, a plan yes well I'm, I'm happy with that so lovely okay good Fine. So I think we'll leave it for that for today. Thank you, everybody, for being so so patient. And uh, I look forward to, yes, sort of taking this further at a later date. We'll find a date. Karen and I will be in touch. And I'd, I'd just like to possible. say, oh, uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed, Monica. It's a real privilege to have been invited to be in conversation with you. And um, 
thank you so much for that. And thank you to everybody else who have joined in the conversation and asked pertinent questions and have been interested in my work. I appreciate it all from the bottom of my heart. And you know who you are, you dear people. Thank you very much for joining us. Indeed, thank you very much. And if I can just put in a, another plug for this event about Otti Berger, I suspect that a lot of you will be interested. It's actually curiously connected, not so curiously connected, on the 29th of April. Go to the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel if you're not familiar with it. There is, though I say it myself, a fantastic array of recordings on topics of direct and sometimes indirect um, uh, relevance to the overarching theme of the project. Um, so there'll be something in a sense for everyone, but there's quite a lot um, on second, third generation. There's actually a separate section of that, uh, writers as well as artists, visual artists and composers as well. Um, and uh, yeah, have a have a browse. And uh, you can also sign up to the newsletter if you would like to be kept informed of future events, because there are lots of interesting things still in the pipeline. Um, if you just go to the bottom right, the sort of scroll right down to the bottom right of the, the homepage of the Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website, uh, you can sign up in two, two seconds. You know, you can do it very easily and then you'll get our, our um, our newsletters. Good. Well, thank you very much again. Apologies, but thanks for sticking with it. And I look forward to seeing you again in the future. All right. All the thank best. You. Karen, thanks ever so much. Thank thanks. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Go on.